So we're here tonight to talk about Malka's award-winning collection of interviews with Joni Mitchell, Joni Mitchell Both Sides Now. So a musician in her own right, Malka started her career as part of the folk music duo Malka and Jozo in 1963. And they're deservedly credited not only with opening Canada's ears to Yiddish and Hebrew music, but also equally as importantly, bringing about the change in perception that saw the immigrant, the ethnic, the newcomer, not as aliens, but as importers of vitality, hope, daring, ancient and avant-garde sophistication, humour and culture. And when their partnership dissolved, Malka continued to perform as a musician, but also moved into television, hosting the weekly CBC programme, Song of Our People. And from that point onwards, it's pretty fair to say that Malka's had an illustrious career, winning awards for her documentary filmmaking, journalism, and her, her first, but hopefully not last novel, Sula, which draws on Malka's own experience of living with the Bedouin tribes, tribe, sorry, in the Sinai Desert. And I had the um, huge pleasure of, of hearing a little bit about that period of Malka's life a few evenings ago, and it was ridiculous, frankly. Uh, so, Joni Mitchell, Both Sides Now, was published with ECW Press last year, and I'm sure it goes without saying to most people here that it's an absolutely beautiful book, a stunning document of over 30 years of friendship. And Joni Mitchell's, as we know, we've had a few conversations about this today, not famed for her love of the press, right? And this is something she talks about in the book, her kind of suspicion of journalists and, you know, no offence to our journalists, but rightly so. And yet, I think what Malcolm manages in this um, collection of interviews which span over 30 years, if, if my maths is right... 40 years. 40 years, yeah. Is, Let's uh, not cut 10 years so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Bad with math. It's a rare talent, right? So as an interviewer, she inquires without prying. And she always goes for the unexpected and really productive question. So if you haven't purchased a copy of her interviews yet, which we can see a copy on there, I'd really urge you to do so after the talk. So we've got, obviously, the book signing and the wine reception, and Waterstones um, will be selling copies of the book. So if you don't have it, if you do one thing this evening, don't, you know, forget about the wine. The wine will wait. There'll always be wine. Buy the book, right? But just buy the book. Okay, so um, that's me for a second. I'm going to introduce Jamie in a moment, but I First, think Malk had a few words before yes, then. Before I, f I, I'm afraid that once I start talking about Johnny, I'll forget everything. And so before we, before I start, I would like to thank Ruth for this wonderful symposium. Really. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just hope that it will be the first of many. I mean, I don't mind copycats of this event all over the world. Although, as you said, copyright, you know, <laughs> right? We're gonna, we've got that stuff on, uh, on lockdown. Okay, so, um, so we'll begin. But before we do, I'd like to introduce... Jamie Zubairi, who is uh, an actor, but also, I understand, um, very, what's the right, I've, I'm struggling for adjectives here, very prolific, I guess, Artist. subscriber to the kind of, the, to the Joni Mitchell list, and you, and you do some paintings for them, as, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hitting the archivist. A, you're the archivist, I'm sorry, I apologise, I actually have that written down, I think my wine <laughs> just kicked in, in that second, um, so Jamie has really, really kindly offered to read... Um, agreed. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Agreed, <laughs> you're right. Not offered. Agreed <laughs> to read from... It's all going now, it's just... Actually, it's all, it's all falling down. Um, sections of Malka's book, um, which are going to intersperse our conversation. So I'd like to welcome Jamie to the stage. I'm sorry about that. Don't <laughs> use that was symbolic. One November night in 1966, I was driving in circles around one block, then another, which was very strange. I always drove with purpose from 
point A to point B, no meandering, no detours, pressing over the speed limit sometimes. Okay, most times. <laughs> Trying to juggle a big career and a household with two little children and a bad marriage. I was always rushing, yet I could never catch up. Why did I deviate from my norm that night? I don't know. Earlier that evening I had been dealt a crucial dilemma, but instead of sleeping on it, as common sense demanded, I was driving on it. Driving from one dark and deserted street to another, they rolled Toronto up for the night very early in those days. It was already winter cold, and the usually humming Yorkville village was deserted. Even the winos and the flower children had taken shelter. The only light still on was above the entrance to the, river, to the riverboat coffee house. I had never gone alone to a club, a bar, or a coffee house so late at night. Only streetwalkers go out alone late at night. My mother had drilled into, my, into me ever since I reached puberty. But it was a night like no other already, and maybe because the street was deserted and no one could see me, I got out of the car and went down the steps into the basement that housed the riverboat. Inside the coffee house was a dark hole. After the eyes adjusted, you could see that the place was empty, except at the back were two of the staff making out. Long and narrow, the coffee house resembled a submarine more than a riverboat, and at a squeeze could hold 120 people decked out in their fab, groovy, or funk attires. They would fall into a hush as soon as the house lights dimmed, crowding so close to the stage that they could almost touch performers like Odetta, Gordon Lightfoot, or Neil Young. But on this November night, bereft of their presence, the place looked forlorn. Devo devoid of the veil of their cigarette smoke, the naked decor seemed embarrassingly tacky. The blue glass in the porthole windows were too harsh to suggest river or sky and the brass that ringed each window was Vegas glitzy. But the pine-panelled walls enhanced the acoustics of a sound system so good it lured musicians from all over the continent to perform there. Solid wood, table, solid wood slab tables anchored the booths and lent the place a sense of permanence, uncommon to most of the coffee houses that were sprouting in Yorkville village like mushrooms after a summer soak. I slid quietly into the darkest booth nearest to the door. On the lit-up stage, a platform, only a foot if that, off the floor, stood a girl who must have picked out a miniskirt at the Salvation Army. With her back, with her back turned to the empty seats, she, she seemed totally engrossed in trying to tune the guitar and failing, trying and failing which gave me the impression that she was one of the waitresses who had nothing better to do than to play act being the performer. Compliments of the house marker, whispered a server as he rested a cappuccino in front of me. Thank you. My fingers clasped the cup to warm up. I savoured the aroma and sipped the cappuccino slowly, very slowly. I was in no hurry that night. I felt like I was sneaking out of life and like stolen water, it was sweet. The girl on the stage also seemed to be in no hurry to do anything but tune and retune her guitar, tune and retune. My cappuccino cup stood empty and still she kept tuning, the knob of one string, then another, this way and that way, a bit higher and just a bit lower, but with such intensity that like a magnet it drew you out of yourself. She turned to face the empty seats and leaning closer to the mic. She strummed a progression of chords with a surprisingly assertive hand. They were unlike any chords I'd heard before. I found myself hanging on every note. And then she started to sing. From verse to verse her song was like a kaleidoscope that splintered my perception, turned it round and round and refocused to illuminate a reality I had not dared to see. Thank you. I continue. You can't. After Please that, do. she just went on and she started to sing, I had a king in a soul trusted carriage who carried me off to his country from marriage too soon. 
Beware of the powers of moon. There's no one to blame, no one to name as a traitor here. I can't go back there anymore. You know the keys won't fit the door. You know my thoughts don't fit the men. They never can, they never can. That's it, she got me a chair. <laughs> I was a puddle, I mean, I was just, you know, it was one of those moments, somebody described it so well that although I'm a lousy reader, I would like you to, to share it with you. I experienced that once in a lifetime moment of unexpectedly stumbling upon the revelation of my own existence. It delivered to me my own passion as a gift, illuminated the wonder of being. This is what I am inside, on the inside. It is the essence of being and also of experiencing being alive. So that was the moment that, that, that is how I felt at that particular moment it was like a whole world opened up for me from the inside. And I knew right there that that's it. I, I, my marriage is finished. It's no use hanging on. And, and that's it. I, I don't have to drive around anymore. I knew what <laughs> I had to do. However, I felt that I was, even before that song, I felt that she was saying, urge for going, you know, urge for going, go Malka, go. And the, the circle game, what are you going round and round, stop it. And every song that she was singing was the story of my life. And I was thinking, this woman, this girl, a, a, a young girl, is singing, this, this, she's got a universal voice, universal poet. I mean, who the hell is she? You know, no one is there. so. I wait until she, sing, she finishes the set, and she finishes the set with both sides now. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> I run to her, she's taking her guitar off, and I said, who wrote these songs? <laughs> and she says, I wrote them. I said, oh my God. Of course, I went much crazier, I'm much older now, and tamer. Anyway, I went crazy over her. Look, I hugged her and I kissed her, a total stranger. And I said, you know, you are, going, you are an immense, immense talent. You're, the world is going to be recognizing of all the wonderful gifts that you have to give us. Uh, and if it doesn't, the world is stupid. <laughs> and you know, this is the only time in my life that I was right. <laughs> So I asked her, what is your name? Because there was nothing, no name on the marquee outside. She said, my name is Johnny Mitchell. I said, wow, Johnny Mitchell, Johnny Mitchell. You know, do you know Leonard Cohen? Yes, I know Leonard Cohen. You are as great as him, even, not even greater. Do you know Bob Dylan? Yes, oh, you are as great as him, even greater. Johnny Mitchell. I was celebrating. I said, and by the way, my name is Malka. She said, I know you, I know you. Because at that time, I was a very big star in Canada. I had a, a, a very prestigious uh, show on te television right after the hockey game mm -hmm. on Saturday night, <laughs> <laughs> coast to coast, amongst other things, you know. So, I mean, Carnegie Hall, Salvador Dali, my, my fan, you know, so people knew me, and she knew me. I said, you, don't, you know me very well in your songs. And I was so floored by her, you know, just crazy, going crazy about her. And you, you want to ask me a question? I don't, I'm, I'm wrapped, I really <laughs> so am. The next day, I, I called it, I waited for the morning, and I called my A&R guy, I was re recording for Capital EMI at that time, and I called my A&R guy and I said, do I have somebody for you to discover? <clears throat> and he said, who? I said, Joni Mitchell, never heard of her. I said, well, that's why you're going to discover her. <laughs> She's huge, huge talent, great singer, great musician, fabulous guitarist, wonderful words. I even remembered some of the words. And I said, you got to come to the riverboat. Oh, it starts very late, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, too late for me, you know. No. So I literally had to drive to his house and pick him up <laughs> and bring him to the 
coffee house to Johnny was working there at that night. So it was her first set. And here it comes, I will not name him out of respect for him. He's still alive and well, thank God. And sorry for not do, following my advice. And, uh, <laughs> and he came there and you know, first of all, he's waiting for the show to start. And you know, the coffee house, it doesn't start on time. And he goes, tapping his foot, tapping the bed, table, tapping the, and Zoni, of course, is tuning the guitar. She has to find the, new, the chords, you know. She doesn't even know what she's gonna sing. She's just figuring, I guess, what she's gonna sing. And she, finally, she started to sing Life in the City. You know the song, Life in the City, you know? You want to sing it? Yes, so she was singing this, and so beautiful, right? And, and he says to me, she has no stage presence. She will amount to nothing. <laughs> so I thought it was an A itch anyway. And, uh, and he left, he left, he left, he left. So I didn't care. I thought he was one of the stupid people in the world. And that's all. I just waited for Tony. I stayed till she finished all her sets, which was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't mind. And I stayed, and I said, wow. And I told her like how great this I stayed like this was like, she sang I think three or four sets, and the one that I heard was like just a short set the night before, so I stayed the whole thing and I was even more impressed. And every night I came and I stayed and we talked, you know, like who she is and all these things, and I was giving her a prophecy of her life that of course came, all came true. <laughs> really, it did. <laughs> and, and, and Can you do that for all of us later? Or? <laughs> Let me see your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Over dinner. No, oh, she was so great. And so the last night she was there, I said, listen, you know, you can hear my accent. I will not sing your songs very well, but at least I would like to sing them in my concerts, if it's okay with you. She just, you know, on the, on the what do you call the napkins Table there? Cloth, yeah. yeah, she just started to write, I had the king, life in the city, you know, like in, all these wonderful songs, I, I didn't keep them because I didn't, I didn't keep them anyway. I moved, so you know, I moved out of the house, I divorced. It was a big, big event in my life because of her, of course, and, uh, and I didn't keep it. But the fact of the matter is that I sang it until those songs were recorded. And in every concert I said, listen guys, remember the name, Joni Mitchell. <laughs> You will, you will hear, hear it first here. She's going to be a huge, huge, huge artist. And so that is how I happened to meet Joni. And so what happens to, what happens to get you to meeting her again in 1973? Right. What, so what are the kind of circumstances that lead up to that? And then what happens when you do meet her again? Well, uh, in 1973, I was already a journalist, also a singer and all these other things, and a mother and divorced woman and all these things, and also <laughs> remarried and bought a big house and uh, to pay a mortgage. And when the producer told me, you know, uh, I can give you a nice gig if you will get Johnny Mitchell. I said, oh God, I mean, she's so famous now. How, I mean, seven years ago that I went crazy about her, what, uh, she'll not remember me. And I said, but because of that mortgage, I phoned, I, f I tried to phone her. <laughs> candor, candor everyone. Knows. Listen, I mean, I didn't know that she was such a good, that she would be, you tell the truth, I didn't know. It was, impo as much as I thought she was, her talent was immense, I didn't know that she had any, that her, when she speaks, it's like poetry. We should treat an interview as an artistic exploration. So it's really an amazing thing. I didn't know then how wonderful she would be to interview. Anyway, I, at that time, pre-Google, hello, hello. How do you find a person? Well, Canada has terrific, has terrific uh, phone system. I phoned the operator and I said, listen, I've got to try to reach Joni Mitchell. Do you know her? Oh, yes, I do know her. Everybody knows her. <laughs> I said, how the heck are we gonna try and find her? Leave it to me. And she tries her record company, the Shantas from this department to that department to the, 
you know, it took about an hour and a half, two hours, until she finally, somebody gave her the management, Johnny Mitchell, her manager, or management office. So I called, and the, the operator said, it's all yours now, okay. So I called, I talked, I said, I would like to do an interview with Johnny Mitchell. And who is calling the say? I said, Malka. And how do you spell it? Okay, I spelled it. I said, is there another name? No, 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 just stick with that name. She will know me, I think. Uh, when, how come she will know you? Well, we had a meeting seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, what, I got, what have I got to lose? Take, here's my number, you know? And I went, figured, okay, it was a good try. I worked for it. I deserved a glass of wine, that's it. I tell you, I swear to you, not late more than five or ten minutes. She, I hear a phone ring, ring a ding. I pick it up. Hi, Malka, it's Johnny. <laughs> I, you know, I was so stunned. Didn't ask her, how did you remember, you know? And you know, I never did ask her. Because that is already history, you know, for us. But at the moment, I was too stunned. And I said to her the truth, Johnny, I had, you know, I'm, I'm a switch to journalism now. I bought a house, I thought she, she knew the district, it was a very, very fine district, and a huge house, huge mortgage. Uh, I, I need to do an interview, would you be willing to? Oh sure, come on over. Uh, but you know I'm rehearsing now, do you mind? I said, no, no, I don't mind. She was rehearsing to go on tour before the record court and Spark came out. You didn't switch off the phone. <laughs> I'm sorry. I spilt wine on myself as well. <laughs> that double bed girl. <laughs> yes. I'm both right. unprepared and covered in wine. Yes. Yeah, so. Sorry. So I'm sorry anyway, I, I came there and uh, she was living. She was sharing a house with David Geffen at that time. There was just, you know, like I think David was renting it from Julie Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. It was certainly a movie star's house, just like you read in the movie magazines. Anyway, she was extremely wonderful. And when I came to that rehearsal, I sat there, and I, I was the only other woman, other than Joni, I was the only other woman there. And sometimes I wonder if that was not, two things happened there. First of all, I was, a, co a colleague she knew that, she, that I knew her before the LA Express, and, and Elliot and everybody else knew her. So I was like the first to know her there in the room, and the first to acknowledge how great she is before anybody else did. And, but then maybe it was because I was also their first audience. I flew in from Canada, I sat in the rehearsal hall, and I was blown away. I mean, those, that band was great. And I knew that this record is going to just be amazing. And that's Court and Spark. Yes, and I want to just tell you, I was asked, how did I prepare for the interview? Well then, before Google time, you couldn't check like what uh, other people wrote about her. And so I didn't read anything about her, but I did play her songs and read her lyrics time and again and again and again and again, day and night. And then one day, my son was then little, and he says to me, Mom, how does a person write a song? And so I asked Joni this question, of course. I told her, my son asked me to ask you. And this was her reply. How does a person create a song? A lot of it is being open, I think, to encounter and to, in a way, be in touch with the miraculous. I'll tell you about the way this one song was written because it has a song within a song. I had the line which went, three waitresses all wearing black diamond earrings, talking about zombies and Singapore slings. Well, the song can be taken on a couple of levels. Symbolically, to me, it represents the Trinity in a way, the three waitresses, it's like a religious parody, making Mecca or making the shrine or the church, bar and grill. I had two verses written to it. I didn't know how it should end. I didn't know what kind of point I was trying to make or anything. 
And one night I pulled into a gas station at four o'clock in the morning. There was an old man there. There was no one else around. And the old man said to me, what are you doing out so late? And I said, well, I've just come from this recording studio down the street. He said, oh, you sing. Then he asked me to sing him a song. But I couldn't. I was tired. I was impatient. I really wanted him to just put the gas in the car and let me go home. Well, listen, he said, if you're not going to sing a song, I'll sing you a song. You know, you can sing just like Nat King. I, you know, I could sing just like Nat King Cole, he said. And he burst into two verses of Merry Christmas, just exactly like Nat King Cole. All this time, he still hadn't put the gas in the car. <laughs> I'm feeling this incredible tiredness and impatience to go home, but he is being amazing. You know, he said, you can write a song about anything, he said. Why, I could make a song about this car, he said. And then he started singing this song about my car having nice tires and white walls and windshields and different things around the gas station. He was so amazing. And then that, the thing came to me. And the thing that I used in writing my songs in the last verse was just the common thing that's banded around now about being here and now about being in the here and the now. It was like I suddenly recognized my impatience to get home was spoiling my absorption of how beautiful and this incident that I was in the middle of was. So, that's, so that became the last verse of the song. It went, he makes up his own tune, right on the spot about white walls and windshields and this job he's got. And you want to get moving and you want to stand still, but caught up in the moment, some longing gets filled and you even forget to ask, Hey, where's Bar and Grill? Bar and Grill being whatever it is you're seeking for. That's you see how she gorgeous. speaks? It's amazing. Yeah. It's <laughs> gorgeous. Thank you, Jamie. What, what were those early experiences yeah. of interviewing Joni like? What did they feel like? I mean, what was the kind of, was there rapport between you? Um, well, it was know, as if happened? the seven years didn't, didn't happen, as if it, we were back in, a, although we were in this multi-million dollar mansion, it was as if, we, she invited me to the kitchen. <laughs> I mean, she must be Jewish sometime, somewhere, you know, <laughs> invited me to the kitchen and we were sitting in the kitchen and I said to her, Johnny, I'm not going to speak with you because I want to record what we are speaking, uh, our conversation. And uh, so everything that we say is on the record, everything, hmm. because otherwise we will gab about everything and the essence will go away and yeah. it will be a shame. So, hello, nice to see you. <laughs> Let's record. <laughs> and so she agreed to it. She knew where I was coming from. It was all a matter of extreme candor. And although from the start she was very, very, uh, I, I was amazed by, by how eloquent she was. It was not like she worked on a song like Leonard 14 years or something. It was like I could see that it can drum came out about uh, any, any subject. I did not ask her questions. She didn't ask me not to ask her, but I simply was not interested in who was her lover last year and all these things that the gossip didn't interest me. And anyway, I was not going, it was for the CBC, so we couldn't put it on the air. And <laughs> so I, we just talked, and, and you know, many years later, I found out that we really we were trying to crack the mystery of the creative process, mm -hmm. both of us. I was coming from one direction, she was coming from another. The only thing that I would like to add, two, two things. First of all, is that we stayed in the same place to, to talk for the interview. We also talked about in the rehearsal hall, but that was not the, in the interview. I was talking to the musicians then and to, to Elliot, but with her, it was in the kitchen. <laughs> it was always in the same place. And during the, the only thing that she told me off the record was that she had a child before we met, before we first met, and she had the child out of wedlock, which was at that time, I mean, it was the shame of shames, uh, very loose 
woman, blah, you know, horrible. And uh, that she was looking to find her now. And that she asked me to keep it secret. And she was so famous, I was afraid. You know, those times we, we recorded on cassettes, you know, like tape to tape. I had a ewer. And I was afraid that the tape would fall into somebody's hands. So I put it in the vault, in, the, in my safe in the bank. God. For 20 years. 20 years. Then it became public and then I took it out of bank. I had the safe just for this, for God's sakes. So that's, that's it. I didn't need it anymore. There is a little story afterwards. You know, did you see that wonderful PBS thing about Joni? Mm -hmm. Well, in 2013, that yeah, yeah. Yes, it, I think it was done before. Okay. You know, yes, yes, right. It was the American Masters. It was very, very Where good. Where she's wearing the green? No, no, that was for the CBC. Okay. No, that was a, a wonderful documentary. Mm. And the, oh, the, right, yeah. the producer of that, American producer of that documentary says, listen, I was doing the research and I saw that you, you kept secret on this for 20 years. What kind of a journalist are you? <laughs> <laughs> so you see where my loyalty lies. To Johnny, much, 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 much more than to journalism. <laughs> so. Well, that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's, that's how it should be in a friendship, no? That's how it is. Good. Okay, we're, gonna, um, we're going to start to wrap up our conversation okay, now, great. just to give you time to ask Malka whatever you'd like to ask her. So I think what I'd like us to do is, is to talk about really quickly kind of what happens to get you full circle back to the to the last interview that you did with her? I mean, what happens, and what was the experience if you, if we think you know that the first interview is when seventy three? Yes, this, and the last interview is when two thousand and twelve. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How does it feel to um, you know you've had a friendship that's developed in the interim and how did it feel to be interviewing her again in 2012? Well I asked different questions of course at that, that time we were both like 70 <laughs> we are interested in, in had the big life work you know so we were interested in different things and I I came I told her that somebody wants to publish these, these conversations uh, and I think they're, they're so good that I'm, I'm going to agree. And I wonder, I said, listen, it would be great if we could talk now over the life that we had uh, with, with the new wisdom, old wisdom. <laughs> and she agreed, you know, so I flew over and all the interviews were done in five days or rather five nights <laughs> and John is in the kitchen <laughs> still or yeah in the kitchen in, in this kitchen or an, another the best conversations and, uh, happen in the kitchen I think and and she would be up all night and I come from Canada which is three hours like at, at three o'clock in the morning LA is six o'clock in the morning for me Toronto time and I'm going like oh god Johnny let's do it tomorrow no, she's, she, once she gets going, she wants to finish it. She wants to get to the core of what she's, it's an exploration, it's not an interview. It's not a conversation. She herself doesn't know where it's going to lead. And of course, I'm, I'm dying to know where it's going to lead. It's, a, it's an amazing journey. So it didn't change in that regard. It just, uh, it's an amazing experience to really, the only difference I think from me and other journalists, I didn't have any agenda. I, didn't, I just wanted to really hear her and what she had to say. And I, if she wanted to talk on a tangent for an hour, it's okay with me. I like the tangents. I think they are brilliant. And so I think this is the, the difference maybe between me and other. And there is, you were mentioning journalists. Mm. We live in a time where if one guy or girl or lady or whatever <laughs> writes Johnny is a recluse. There, everybody sees it. If you want to check on Google Johnny, it comes up and it's like a fact. And that guy made, maybe he made it up, but once it is in print or in, or in the net, it becomes a fact and people ask me, what, she's a recluse. I go, 
What a close, it's nonsense. We went uh, just last November, we, I was telling <laughs> Ruth, there was no table, with, they put the table in, on the sidewalk on uh, Sunset Boulevard, and we were sitting and having dinner there. People were approaching her, Johnny, we love your music, thank you very much. No bodyguards, no nothing. I don't know where this journalist come with these sayings. So Johnny suspects journalists because they don't tell the truth. I don't understand it. But anyway, it sells. It sells better to say, if you say a recluse, it will sell better when I say, she's not a recluse, you know? Mm. So then what is so great about her, you know? So they make up the stories to sell. Yeah, it would make for a great, great headline, would it? Joni, colon, not a recluse. <laughs> <laughs> Exclamation mark. <laughs> Joni out. Picture, cute picture of Joni socialising. No, not good. OK, so two more questions before I, I turn you over okay. to the crowd. Bless you. Bless, Bless you. you. What do you see, um, do you see kind of where Joni's influence on other artists oh. lies today. And I'm thinking particularly of something you told me about Cameron Crowe. Oh, that was very funny. It was in the same time that uh, last November when I came to Johnny's birthday at the uh, museum. It was, what is the name of this museum? The Hammer. The Hammer, yes. In LA, right? Uh, lovely place, by the way. And the, it was the big public one. And people came to me, uh, uh, a guy, gorgeous guy came to me, he said, <laughs> I'm Cameron Crow Malka. I want to tell you that I owe you my career. I said, my God, Cameron Crow, I owe him. I love the almost famous. I love Jerry Maguire. I love how I got you. I knew you got me at hello. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I adore him, didn't know him. And I, <laughs> I laughed. I thought, I thought it was very funny. And I laughed and I said, what, what's going on here? And he said, it's true. When I wanted to get into journalism, to, I wanted to write for the Rolling Stone magazine. And I was a kid and they told me, look, if you can get the Led Zeppelin and interview the Led Zeppelin, we'll give you something, to, we'll give you that interview in Rolling Stone. And of course they gave it to him because the Led Zeppelin didn't give interviews. But he, being stupid like I was, you know, with Johnny just phoning her, and so he, he tried to figure how to entice them to give him an interview. And he heard that they loved Johnny Mitchell. Led Zeppelin, crazy about Johnny Mitchell. So he was looking to give them something about Johnny Mitchell that they didn't have, nobody had. Certainly nobody had it in the States because the interview that they did with Johnny was broadcast in Canada. So an exclusive. Yes, it was just an exclusive for, for three years, yes. And uh, he got a bootleg tape of this 73 interview. And he said to the Led Zeppelin, if I give you this interview with Joni, nobody had an interview with Joni then. If I give you this exclusive interview with Joni, would you give me an interview with you for the Rolling Stones? I said, okay, let's hear it. Well, a few days later, they come and they said, okay, we'll give you the interview. And it was on the cover of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> so he comes and he said, well, the reason that I come, it's not to tell you the story. I'm going to put the story in my website. I want a copy of the tape. I gave them my only copy. <laughs> 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 so, of course, you know also that this is Cameron Crowe, but you know also a British... Uh, Cinema maker, he put it in love actually. Mm -hmm. and Richard that, Curtis. Yes. So that he was apparently, Johnny told, he told Johnny that he was affected by, really inspired by her la latest version of both, both sides now. So we had a paper on that today. You see Joe there wearing the blue shirt? Yes. She gave a paper on Richard Curtis today. Oh, really? So, oh. She's so can I, I have a favor. Can, can, can I have a copy of those papers? And also, uh, you have about the cactus tree. I love that. I would love to hear what you have to say because I have something <laughs> to say about it also, of course. <laughs> it speaks to me so much, you know, as, as an artist, about the, the conflict between life and art. So I want to know what you have to say about it. May I? Absolutely. You, you can give it to Ruth and she'll give it to me. She will. 
I've yeah. asked her. <laughs> I feel like that's a really natural time for us to open up to you. What do you think, Marcus? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, let's go. Questions? Questions for Malka? Mike? A uh, really obvious one. Do you Pardon? Know a really obvious one. Do you know how her health is? She's coming along really nicely. Uh, she's getting better every day. She's, at her, she's resting very, very nicely at, at her home. Beautiful home. You know, she's got the best care in the world. And uh, they expect a full recovery before long, I hope. I plan to go there next month or this, the end of this. Oh, it's already July. This month, hopefully, yes. Yeah. Did you describe your first meeting with Joan as an incredibly awe-inspiring moment for you? Uh, almost a quasi-religious moment. The really? Yes. It sounds almost like a religious revelation that other people might, might have. Uh, did you ever think you were in the presence of a kind of superhuman intellect person? <laughs> was, it, was, it, was, it, was it of that level of power to you? Yes, I, w I knew almost after the second song that I was in the presence of a unique kind of genius. I knew without any doubt that she was very, very, very wonderful poet and musician. I mean, her car blew me. I mean, I just was crying all over the place and bloating is the only person there, like a mad woman. And I was very glad every night came a few more people, a few more people, and I stayed for all the sets. I mean, I really thought <coughs> that day, I, I truly believed I was really awed. I mean, to tell you the truth, more than by Dylan and, and, and Leonard Cohen, I thought she was immense. And this, you know, at that time she was extremely young. Her voice, I mean, it hovered like forever. I mean, you could have a cappuccino and she's still singing <laughs> in, the, in the breath. I mean, she was, she, you no, know, it wasn't corrupt by all the cigarettes. She was just like, a, being a singer myself and a musician, I could appreciate maybe the music more than most people at that in that particular place. I knew what it took to sing those songs before I sang them. And the chords, I mean, I never heard such chords. And I understood why she was tuning the guitar like that. I had the, all the patience in the world. So I knew, yes, I did know. Well, I thought she was a poet. I thought she was a sort of like Mozart. You know, like you, you cannot really put an age on it. I felt she was a poet, a real poet. And, uh, and look at Dylan, he wrote uh, Blowing with the Wind when he was, what, 19? You know, so it, you can, so, I'm sorry to put them in the same breath, please, Johnny, forgive me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that thunder, thunderbolt will yes. be striking you down any second, Malka. But uh, yes. I knew it didn't, uh, it didn't, it was, what was really uh, striking was that it came from such a young girl, you know, I, I, I'm a little older than her and I was thinking, wow, this is immense. But I didn't think it was a girl already, I thought it was a poet and an artist. I didn't think of her anymore as a girl. If you know what I mean, I mean, I don't know how to describe it. Mm. I think of her as a girl when I'm speaking with her. But when I heard her that night, I thought of her as an artist. John. Did you ever play or sing with Jane? I didn't say, oh God, no, I didn't sing. I, I sang her songs. I sang her when she left, after she finished with the, when she gave me all the lyrics, I, I studied them. And I didn't, I had to remember the melody because there was no record. So I sang them, I, I was, singing a lot of concerts at that time and coffee, sh coffee house gigs, you know. So I sang them for about two years until... Never with her? Never with her, no, no. I didn't really have a desire for that, you know. It was like, uh, it was really a one, once in a lifetime I thought, that's it. I really was privileged. I thought, you know, 
And I still do. I still think, yes. Yes. Uh, I, you may not have been in the room this afternoon for the discussion, but I, I, wasn't. I want to ask you the question that was bandied about. People were talking about how in, in all of their scholarly works that if you're talking about these other people, Leonard Cohen, you might say Cohen, 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 or uh, Dylan, 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 but people say Joni, 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 and, and, and some people even said they wrote their papers, they said Mitchell, Mitchell, and then when they gave their papers, they said Joni. Do you, is there something of, about her, her, the way she expresses herself? You saw her so early that she draws you in that you feel like you know her more than you might another person that it feels a more personal connection? Do you know what I'm asking? I never thought about it, to tell you the truth, until now. I think uh, the fact that she's Canadian, maybe, you know, but Leonard also in Canada, we call him Leonard. And uh, when he gave a concert, and everyone said, Leonard, we love you, you know, but don't say, Leonard Cohen, we love you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, people approach her, they don't say, Joni Mitchell, they just say, Joni, we love your songs. Thank you for the music, you know. They're very polite. Nobody bothers her, except for the time, you know, when they were killing people, you know, in California. There were murderers in the streets, you know, that was dangerous then. But uh, she never had a, a bodyguard, no. No, I don't, I, the answer to your question, I don't know. I really didn't think of it even, to tell you the truth. Okay, we have time for two more questions, yes. Um, you, you've spoken about the creative process quite a lot, and we've heard a lot of that today. Um, my the question is, given that you see her first and foremost, I think, as a poet, does she... A poet and artist, I think, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Not in it, my personal life. No, no. Yes. I, I, is it the case that she <coughs> writes a poem which becomes a song because she then finds a melody for it, or does she ever create a melody and then find words to go with it? I think we, we have it in the book. She, she, mentioned, she writes about it in the book. Okay. Uh, I think she starts with the melody first, you know, first. <coughs> Sometimes, <coughs> uh oh. Take the lozenge, it's time for the lozenge. <coughs> it's so dry in here. Yeah. The, the wine is also dry. <laughs> <coughs> but the right kind of dry, right? I mean, you know. I'll have to reread the book. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I was always concerned that when she would give interviews, she would talk about uh, the sort of the conflict and the control that the record companies had and some of her disrespect. From She's talking about it a lot yeah. in the interview, really, a lot. And yet it seems like somehow she was able to get contracts to keep a hold of her work and become wealthy. <coughs> not be ripped off by the music corporation or whoever was running that. You'll have to buy my book. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you'll find it. She's talking, she says, that because she got divorced from Mr. Mitchell and she got a raw deal in that divorce, she learned how important it is to have a contract at a very young age. And that's what gave her the idea to have a copyright of her songs. That's what it gave her the idea. So I see from a bad thing c can come a good thing. Mm. From a very bad thing came a very good thing. And uh, she also describes, you'll see in the book, <laughs> said, how did you manage to really elude, you know, like the record companies? They want to have hits and Johnny was not interested in it. She was interested in exploring new territories. And she's an explorer, that woman. And so she said, well, she kept under the radar. She knew that they were after the top dog, and so she played the, the small dog, <laughs> so that they will not, you know, always keeping the cost down. And I think it's one of her talents to find terrific talent, <clears throat> to find amazing musicians, her recording engineering, Henry Louis, oh, an absolute, absolute, Angel, he loved her so much. He gave her tremendous, and he, he is the one who allowed, convinced her to have the laughter after Yellow Taxi. <laughs> it happened in the studio, I said, Johnny, let's keep it. So he's one of those souls. 
you know, is, is, he passed on, but it's a good example, you know, Henry, all these terrific musicians that she's with. Amazing talent. It's a talent to do that, by the way, I believe, anyway. Good. Okay, that's <coughs> all we have time for for this portion, so that we can get Malchus to some book signings. Okay. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Oh, he wants to say something? No, okay. No, he's, he's poised to clap. Okay. That's, his, that's the international symbol for clapping oh, you. So yes, I okay. hope that everyone will, yeah, and that as well. No, just hold, hold it. <laughs> um, I just, I'm, this has just been brilliant. Thank you so much to Malka. This has been My amazing. Um, I'm, we're now at the bottom of, of a bottle of wine, so frankly, <laughs> it's either downhill oh, yeah, or yeah, really. uphill from here. Um, please join me in thanking Malcolm Aram for an amazing <laughs> talk.